Hi everyone, uh, thanks for joining us for this webinar on the Bosky programming language. Uh, my name is Mark Marin. I'm a member of the Research and Engineering Software Engineering Group here at Microsoft Research, and I'm the lead on this Bosky programming language project. So to start out with, I'd like to talk a little bit about sort of what are the high level things we wanted to investigate and think about uh, during this research. So the first one is this concept of an intermediate representation in programming languages and compilers. Now, initially, these were introduced to simplify the process of compiling from a high level language like C++ down into the actual binary that executes on your compiler where you might not want to figure out how to compile every statement in C++ all the way down to a binary in one step. The idea is you introduce an intermediate layer that is simpler than the source, but still contains a lot of the key features that you want to reason about to emit optimized code. Now, over the years, um, these intermediate representations started to expand in what they were used for. They went from simple waypoints to stage the compilation actually being very important to writing the optimizer, to building other tools like verifiers and refactoring systems. And the, the problem is it still remained, the primary thinking about it was as an intermediate step in compilation, but the major use of it was for program understanding and building tools on top of this. So what we wanted to do is ask the question, can we build an intermediate representation that is actually focused on supporting these other tasks like generating very optimized code or verification and not worry about the specifics of the source language. What would that intermediate representation look like? And can we simplify it so that we are actually can build much more effective optimizers or better bug detectors? Now, the second question we had is, um, it's one thing to be able to come up with a, a more powerful intermediate representation that supports these things, but we also want to go back and eventually connect it back to this source language, right? And we don't want to connect it to any source language. We want to look at sort of what is the most productive, most uh, flexible languages that are in use today. And these, in our, in our opinion, come from like the cloud programming environment where they're highly dynamic, they have records, they have tuples, they have union types, they're very flexible languages, right? And so this is an interesting question is, can we connect a constrained intermediate representation to this very dynamic source language? And as we're doing this, are there features that by having this constrained intermediate representation that we can reason about very effectively, are there features that this supports in the source language that are actually much more valuable than if we had a weaker intermediate language? So with that, I wanna you know, start and jump straight into a demo and show you what we have and sort of motivate why we started this project. So this is an example of a simple Bosky program that's implementing a calculator application. Uh, it supports the operations negate, add, and subtract. And the main function here takes uh, the operation you wanna perform as a string, plus a first argument as an int, and an optional second argument indicated by the question mark here as um, an int as well. Now, Bosky, as we said, is we really wanna focus on being able to build reliable software and powerful tooling. So it has, as language primitives, requires, ensures, and check operations. So it's very easy to add validation logic to make sure that your application performs as expected. Now, we can go ahead and compile this program to see that it works. And if I switch over to the terminal, I can toggle up and say that if we add two and three, the output is five as expected. Now, we said we wanna do more than just compilation in Bosky. So an example of doing that here is, I wanna understand, is it possible if I expose this, say as a RESTful endpoint, are there errors that might occur as someone's using this? So we have a, fe a feature called symbolic testing, where I can actually translate this program to first order logic, uh, run a theorem prover in our case Z3 on it, and it will search and see if it can find any possible inputs that would cause an error. So you can see here that it has found the case where if we call the subtract op, uh, operation with 38 and the value none, that'll actually fail on this check operation, right? Now, uh, we can check that that actually is a failing input by switching back to our terminal. And you can see that it does in fact fail. So we can check that it fails, but we can also add another requires clause 
that will check And if we rerun our symbolic tester, it'll now report that no errors were found. So we can be confident that no one will be able to denial a service or crash our web app if we deploy this um, in, an, in an unprotected endpoint. So that kind of shows the power of the intermediate representation coupled with this high level, uh, very familiar scripting style language that most web devs would be familiar with. So that demonstration shows how Vosky's intermediate representation is able to support uh, sophisticated tasks like actually doing program verification and full error detection there using a theorem prover. So let's start by talking about the features of the intermediate representation that make that possible. Um, now, before we go in, in, into depth, uh, just the Bosky IR is based on sort of a standard design for these compiler intermediate representations where you take an opcode and all its arguments are given in single registers. So we've denested all functions and simplified all of the operator uh, nesting. It uses a control flow graph model, which is actually a DAG in our case, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And while you'll hear the term single static assignment for many compiler IRs, uh, the Bosky IR is actually a single dynamic assignment form, and we'll see why that is important uh, in a little bit. But just so you have some context, here's a simple uh, function compiled to Bosky's intermediate representation where we have uh, one input argument. We start at the entry block. We assign a temp value, you know, the result of I greater than zero, and then based on that, we'll jump to either L0 or L1. We'll perform some operations and eventually we'll jump to the exit block where return is assigned either our res one or res two, depending on which block it came from. And this is uh, common in single static assignment forms or uh, allows us to do our single dynamic assignment. Now, this should be fairly familiar to people who have seen uh, other compiler IRs. Now, what's gonna be less familiar is, uh, as I mentioned, the DAG. So in the Bosky IR, there are no looping constructs or back edges. And the reason we wanted to do this is once you have loops in your IR, uh, let's say you wanna uh, convert this to first order logic. Well, now you need to generate things called loop invariants, uh, which is very difficult. If you're writing a compiler optimization, you're gonna need to do iterative data flow analysis uh, potentially multiple times. And the, the end result of all of this is that if you have a looping structure in your IR, you're either gonna to have to pay uh, increasing computational cost to reason about the code involved in that loop, or you're gonna to have to make simplifying assumptions that are gonna give you imprecisions in your results. Now, what's interesting is looking at these loops or loops in general, most of them are actually instances of a very small set of what we call common idioms. And in the last, I'd say 10 years, we've really seen growing anecdotal evidence that most loops are really in these set of small idioms with the popularity of libraries like uh, C Sharp's link, Java streams, or things like Lodash if you're coming from JavaScript that allow you to write almost any loop you'd want as a simple higher order function plus a, um, um, a Lambda. Now, interestingly, in 2018, there was a very nice paper that I was lucky to be a co-author on called Mining Semantic Loop Idioms that actually applied some sophisticated machine learning to look at hundreds of thousands of lines of code and figure out how many loops fell into one of these small common idioms. And what we found is that, yes, in fact, most loops do fall into this class of idioms and could be fairly accurately categorized. So we initially thought that in Bosky, uh, we would leave loops in and just use these common idioms as templates for doing the analysis. The problem is these common idioms look for patterns much like a developer would in this code. So if I wanna know what this code does, I say, oh, it, it goes over all the elements in V, it applies some predicate to each element, and if it's satisfied, it pushes it back to V prime. So just from these sort of basic characteristics, I would say this loop is a filter. The problem is that's only true if P is a pure function that returns a bool someone might write P like this instead, where it's actually modifying the vector V as it's processing it. That means that in order to understand this loop, I need to look at the body, I need to do extra analysis there, I need to project this back into the template, and it becomes not much um, 
it, it's only slightly better than uh, the, the version where I didn't have these idiom templates at all. So instead, what we want to do in Bosky is look to the inspiration of things like link and lodash and say we are not going to support loops in the source language. We're just going to give you these higher order operations with Lambda functions. Now, what that means is that in the IR, we don't need to have back edges in the control flow graph and every loop just becomes a um, invoke of one of these higher order functors, which we have a small set of. And then we flatten the lambdas actually into first order functions. So it's very simple to analyze this and understand what each piece of code is doing. The next thing we wanted to get rid of, which causes many, many problems in various analysis and optimization, is mutable state. And this causes two big pain points. One is if you're doing verification and you learn something about, say, variable X, and then you make an assignment to variable X, you need to sort of forget everything that you previously knew about X and every other relationship with it. So you need to both be able to assert facts and retract them. For things like optimizers as well, you also need to start producing things called frame rules about what a method may or may not change or facts may or may not be affected and make sure to propagate this. Now, these are both longstanding and open problems with decades of previous research. And um, instead of uh, attempting like uh, to, to, to come up with a brilliant new solution where many, many smart people previously had only made incremental progress, we decided to just force um, mutability out of Bosky entirely. So here's an example of you know, a place where it does cause you problems. So here we have a struct point, and we want to make a simple assertion that foo of p equals foo of p. Now, without mutability, this would sort of be trivial because these functions don't change p at all. Applying the same function to the same arguments should have the same result. But with mutability, if foo, which we've sort of elided the body here, happens to modify p, then this is not true at all. So just to answer these simple questions, we suddenly need to go analyze many other functions and reason about their behavior. And of course, it becomes even more complicated when you add in aliasing, because now with P and Q alias, calling foo on P may impact Q. So this is where we need these frame rules to express what part of parts of foo may be modified, what parts of Q may be overlapping with those parts of P, and we need to reason about all of that just to understand if Q of X equals basically old Q of X here. So this is this is a this is a very challenging problem. And you know, if you talk with people from the functional programming space, they say all of this is much simpler if values are immutable. So we took that same viewpoint, and in Bosky, uh, the, all the values are immutable. Um, now the next thing we come to is equality, and this is a very seemingly simple, but it's a complex concept in many languages that can become very subtle very quickly. So in most languages, you have primitive values, which are compared by a value equality. So integers or enumerated values. Then you have some other objects which are compared by pointer equality, right? Which is sort of the default for maybe user declared objects. And of course, developers can often overload the equality operator. Um, so you have yet a third behavior. And at any point in time when you're doing a quality comparison, you have to sort of reason about which of these equality operations might be the one in use. It causes further problems when we're trying to do program analysis. So um, a very interesting thing is pointer equality uh, breaks referential transparency, which is of the very nice property that if I give two, uh, call the same function with two values that are the same, then the result is the same. In the case of pointer equality, two objects that have the same values in their entire object structure, but different pointers may return different results. So I can't swap, say, by value for by reference without breaking all sorts of things, right? So this is a problem when we introduce pointer equality. Um, it also introduces aliasing, which is the need to reason about whether two objects point to the same thing. And um, interestingly, from a compiler standpoint, Pointer equality is very useful if you're compiling or executing on a CPU where an object lives at a memory address and it makes a lot of sense. But instead of compiling to a CPU, perhaps I'm trying to compile to an FPGA or a um, uh, actual hardware, you know, a chip. And in this case, the 
object is represented not by bytes at a specific memory location, but uh, by signals on a set of wires. And so this correlation between address and equality totally breaks down. And so in practice, you have to end up synthesizing an address that's propagated through this circuit. And then you have to re-inflate the object graph in just the right way. And this becomes very difficult to get right. And so it really limits the amount of places that you can apply these accelerator architectures. Now, instead in Bosky, we're gonna take the very simplified view and we're going to restrict equality to value equality everywhere. So there's no guessing about which version of equality a given uh, application of the equals equals operator might be. And further, to prevent accidental, very expensive equality uh, computations on large object graphs, we're gonna restrict the equality operator to only work on a set of key types. Now, this might seem a little restrictive initially, but we have a fairly rich set of primitive key types. So in addition to the common int or string, we also have things like UUIDs, uh, content hashes, um, timestamps, many other things. We also allow you to lift these primitive uh, equality types to user-defined things. So in this example, I have a identifier point ID that is actually a key value, and it is a tuple of two integers, say a point in two-dimensional space. And so now I can compare two of these point IDs for equality, I can use them as keys in a dictionary, and I can do it very efficiently. Um, nicely enough, we also get referential transparency. So on any function call, I can convert from by reference passing to by value passing. I can allocate things on the stack very freely. So this opens up a huge range of compiler optimization opportunities, as well as makes it much easier to encode um, a given's program semantics to first order logic in a very uh, clean, compact and friendly way, right? So as I say here, um, equality now matches the theorem provers equivalent semantics uh, with a theory of uninterpreted functions, which is sort of the simplest, cleanest way to do this first order logic encoding. The last major feature of the Bosky IR, which is interesting and turns out to be very important to being able to do um, all of these tasks we want and enable the understanding of the program semantics is non-determinism. Now, in most programming languages, there can be two sources of non-determinism. So there's undefined behavior, like reading from an uninitialized memory location, and there can be implementation-defined behaviors, such as what is the order of enumerating objects in, say, a set or a map. Now, uh, undefined behaviors are not possible in Bosky because it's a safe language, but implementation-defined behaviors are, are often present even in safe languages. And it's because you say, oh, you know, it doesn't matter. Maybe the, the developer who's writing the runtime should be able to define what, how the keys in a map are ordered because they'll make it more performant. The problem is if we want to then reason about the behavior of a program that flattens a map into a list, let's say, now we need to assume that any key in that map could be the first element in that list. And if we make an assertion on that first element of the list, we now have an explosion in the size of the map of number of cases to consider. So this can lead to a big blow up in the time that the, uh, let's say verifier has to run, but it also leads to a big usability problem where there might be an input which causes a crash under one possible enumeration order. that doesn't match the implementation order you have. So we will give you a, let's say a failing input that doesn't actually fail, which is very frustrating to a developer. So Bosky goes and fully specifies all semantic behaviors. There's no implementation defined or undefined behavior. So these things all come together to make it very easy to take a Bosky program and reason about it, either using data flow techniques or using theorem provers like Z3. So for people who are familiar with SMTLib, I wanna show quickly, this is the, um, example we were looking at. And this is actually the SMTLib output produced. As you can see, it's almost identical in terms of structure. There's very little extra code about reasoning about equality. So for example, when we compare arg2 to none, we're just using the 
logical equals. We didn't have to do any encoding of a special equality operator for the Bosky semantics. We were just able to take Z3's notion of equality. Um, similarly, for any function calls or operators, we don't need any frame rules or anything complex like this. So the result is a very clean, very compact set of first order logic that is we can reason about very effectively using Z3 in our case. So the next thing we want to talk about is we have a core IR that allows us to do many interesting things from uh, compiler, verification, developer tool space. How do we actually build a language on top of it that is expressive, powerful, and easy for a developer to use? Um, so the first thing we want to make sure is that the developer can write rich and full computation in it. We don't want a simple DSL where you can write 80% of your program in Bosky and suddenly get stuck. So Bosky is a Turing complete language. You can express anything you want in it. There's no worry about running out of runway in what you need to do. Um, we've talked a lot about theorem proving, but we want this to be transparent to the developer. So in the design of our, our source language, we wanted to make sure that you didn't need to know about proofs or specification language or learn some first order logic derivative in order to express some condition that was important to be true or needed to be correct. We also wanted to make this approachable by a developer coming from say C Sharp or Java or TypeScript. They should see the code, they should feel comfortable with it, and perhaps within a few days of working with it, they should be proficient and productive. And finally, we wanted to try and look as far forward as we could. We wanted to think about what is programming in a cloud-centric distributed world look like. So we didn't want to build a language that was optimized for, say, building a desktop application, right? We wanted to build a language that was optimized for having multiple services communicating with each other, perhaps talking to a phone, perhaps talking to some IoT devices, and could run on this wide range of you know, computational resources and distributed um, execution environment. Now, to do this, we really looked at a bunch of other languages and said, let's take the best ideas that are out there. there there's no need to you know, ignore great ideas just because we didn't come up with them. So we borrow very heavily from TypeScript and the ML family of languages with some careful design to make sure that these language features match what the Bosky IR can do. We spent some time trying to eliminate some common anti-patterns that you might see uh, going on, especially in, in cloud programming. And we really wanted to focus on, you know, in the cloud world, speaking over RESTful APIs. What does this mean for the programming language and how you work with it? So let me just show a couple other samples um, to give you a feel for what the Bosky language looks like. So here's an absolute value function. Uh, you notice it's block scoped. We assign the sign value in a couple of different places here. Bosky is okay with that. We allow you to mutate variables and we'll show you how later, just not values. So this makes it easy to write sort of imperative-ish code when you need it. Uh, we also have this function all odd, which shows Bosky supports rest and spread parameters. So uh, I can call foo with a three variables, four variables, however many variables. Um, it shows how inside we use these higher order functions, in this case, all with a lambda. And here's one that's a little more creative. So suppose I have a three uh, uh, points. So they have maybe two dimensional points and three dimensional points. And I wanna convert them, truncate them to two dimensional points in the X, Y, Z plane. So this function expresses that it has this type of a record of X and Y with an optional field Z. So you can pass in two and three dimensional points. And now we have a union type. So this could also be none. Uh, in this body, we have null, null coalescing. So I can access P with this question mark dot operator. And if it's none, I'll automatically skip the rest of the operations. And then I'm not just accessing a single field in P, I'm actually saying take P, access the X and Y fields and construct a new record out of this. And then we have another null coalescing operator for the default x equals zero, y equals zero point. So below you can see we make call this function with a couple different arguments, a two-dimensional point, which produces zero, three as expected, 
uh, three-dimensional point where we've truncated Z and kept X and Y, and then none where we return the default value. So um, I mentioned block scoping and mutable variables are very nice. And we actually found that this is seemingly a simple thing, but it really matches what developers want to do in chunking their computation and thinking about small parts in a linear manner. And it also allows us to really add some creative syntactic sugar that addresses some common pain points when you're doing otherwise functional programming. Right? So here's our absolute value function. And it's you see we're actually assigning the value in two places. And as I said, we, we didn't want to have multiple assignments to the same thing because then we need to basically be able to retract facts in our analysis. So what we do instead is we use this single static assignment form, but since we have no loops, we end up in a single dynamic assignment form. So you see that each variable here is assigned in exactly one place. And we introduced a special phi function that allows us after the if to either take the sign zero value if the if was not taken and the sign one value if the if was taken. And so in this way, we can take um, a block of code that assigns a value multiple times and convert it into a value, uh, block of code where each variable is assigned only once. Now, what does this allow us to do? Well, one sort of, I would say, anti-pattern that we see in functional programming where you can't mutate values is the case where I have something like an environment. Let's say in this case, I have a set of strings and I wanna map them to integers because it's more efficient to compare two ints than two strings. And so I'll have an environment that is basically my intern map and I wanna add a new string to it. In this code, the first thing I'll do is see if the string is already in the map. And if it is, I'll return the existing integer. If not, I'll add that new string to the map. And in functional programming, this I can't mutate the map. So this will generate a new map in this let envp equals env add. Then I'll return both the int that the string was in turn two, but I also have to return the new map. And so I end up with code like shown below where I sort of have to manually assign this updated environment to a new variable and make sure I pass it through to the next call to this function in the right way. And if I get this wrong, I'll end up in turning two strings to the same int, which would be very bad, or perhaps dropping a string that I'd interned previously. So this is very buggy and error prone and requires a bunch of extra typing. Instead, what we did is we added this keyword ref. And what ref allows me to do is the function will take that variable in and it can reassign that variable in the function body. So as you see, no longer are we creating a, a new environment variable. We're just updating the old environment variable to the newly created environment and we return it. The ref also allows the call error to have its variable named m modified in the environment as it goes through. Now behind the scenes, it does the same uh, unrolling to the multiple assignment and multiple return as we saw in the previous value or the previous slide. But now the developer no longer needs to manually manage all of this. So they get this much cleaner code where env is declared once, it's passed as a ref parameter to each call to in turn string. And even as it goes along in the bottom, we can show it is updated appropriately on each at each point. Another thing that we saw as a real anti-pattern in, in especially functional programming code is the case where I'm going to destructure a value. I'm going to update one field. In this case, I have a point with an X and Y, and I want to update the X field only and copy the Y field. And I now need to manually pull out each field of the existing object, place it in a new object, and return it. This is, of course, uh, you know, time consuming to type out, and it's also error prone if you can misorder things. And it can be very difficult if you're doing this, say, with objects when you're past the superclass and you don't know which subclass it might be and which fields you actually need to access and which constructor you need to call. So Bosky provides what we call bulk value operations to support this case and many other similar ones. So let's look at how this, this works. So we have the same point update code now we're calling this function update and we're passing x equals v. Update is a special method that will look at the type of p, look at all its fields, copy all of those automatically for you and update the one you specify. Now this is really nice because 
you know, if we later decide we want to work with three dimensional points, we don't have to go and find every place where we are going to do this copy extract, you know, new value. The update function will automatically deal with this Z point for us. So this saves a ton of time, the potential for a ton of bugs. And it's not just for, um, you know, update a single field. We can also update multiple fields. You can project types out of a given thing. This works for tuples and objects, and it also provides merging, appending, projecting across the whole set. So it allows you to basically, rather than plucking at individual values in objects, to operate them as logically consistent structures in a very efficient manner. Now, um, as we mentioned, Bosky is really focused on correctness and verification. So we wanted to make it easy for you to add assertions to your code that would be checked automatically and help you find bugs more quickly. Um, a lot of cases, if you don't have good language support for this, you end up with some ad hoc situations where you're using explicit conditionals and aborts mixed in with your regular logic control flow. If you want to be able to turn debugging off and on at different levels, you need some sort of static variables that you configure. And it just leads to a lot of effort in implementing these. And it means that your checking logic is actually getting mixed in and obscuring your actual uh, application, you know, business logic that you care about. So in Bosky, we provide a very comprehensive set of operators. In this case, we can do a release, uh, a requires in either regular mode where it'll only be done in debug or test, or you can specify release where it will always be checked. Um, we have insurers, we provide data invariants, we provide uh, checks for inline assertions. And the nice thing is all of this is uh, fully exposed to the type checker and the verification tools. So it can actually make your coding experience much smoother and help you find bugs much faster. Now there's verification uh, and checking for crashing error conditions, but there's also the need to handle um, non-fatal but uh, error result conditions. Perhaps you're writing a parser and you see an invalid token. You don't want to terminate the application, but you want to express to the developer that this parse failed and pro propagated on up. Again, this can lead to a lot of logic with conditionals, but we provide a nice way uh, to validate certain conditions hold. And rather than writing an if, we have this or return operator to allow you to return a result error. Um, now, it's not just initially finding this error and returning it, but you'll have a lot of logic. Perhaps the caller uh, has the case where it's expecting either a success or an error condition, and you don't want to have to nest everything in if error uh, is not equal to none, then handle the error logic. So this or return also allows you to find that error, wrap it up in something new, or even with this when condition add a, add a special check it is not just for the built-in types error and none. Now, we wanted to show this not to claim that we were the first uh, language to introduce special case syntactic sugar for handling errors. Many other modern languages like Rust and Go and TypeScript are all adding very interesting features to make error handling and propagation faster, safer, and, and easier to help developers build better code. But we did want to show that these features, which are really at the cutting edge of how modern programming languages are being built, work just fine in Bosky and actually map to our IR without a problem. So we're giving up very, very little, if anything at all, by having this more constrained IR. So the next thing we wanted to pivot to, though, was I think it's a little more interesting feature that is not in any languages out there and actually is an example of a virtuous cycle between the more powerful IR we have and enabling a language feature that is actually more useful to developers and that language feature providing capabilities back to the IR so that tools using that IR are more effective. So let's look at what we call type strings. Now, these are a novel mechanism for lifting what is often the known structure of a contents of a string into the type of that string. So we have two types and I'll get to a little more detail in a minute. The first is called safe string, and it's based on using a regular expression to validate the contents of the string. The second is string of that uses a user-defined try-parse method 
to validate the contents of the string. And this is useful for when the validation logic is too complex to fit into just a single regex. Now, the nice thing is having this information in the type makes it easier for a developer to figure out what the string actually means. Uh, you know, is it pixels? Is it M's? Is it some other form of measure? These can all be distinguished. It lifts this information into the type checker. So if you try and do something type unsafe with the strings, it can be flagged. And it makes this structure available to tools like structured fuzzers. So rather than exploring string parsing validation logic, they can actually explore the business logic of your code. So let's look at an example. So we have here a type def, we have a zip code that is um, five digits followed by an optional hyphen and four digits. And we have a class called path that provides this try parse method. And this would be for like a file system path in, in Windows or Linux. Now we can write a couple things. So we can declare a variable safe string of zip code validated, and we can try and assign that the string okay. Um, the type checker will report this as an error because we can't assign a raw string to a safe string. We could also try and say the uh, S2 is a safe string of zip code and assign it zip code quote OK. So this is the uh, safe string literal for OK. This would also be an error because the type checker will check that it does not match the specified uh, regular expression. And of course here, if you have a safe string, of zip code 98052, this will be okay because the regular expression includes uh, that, that string, right? Um, now for string of, you have the same sort of thing. I can declare a path of dot slash source tests, and this is okay because presumably that will be accepted by my try parse method. The interesting thing is this also allows us a very nice way to declare object literals. So by doing this at symbol, I can tell the language that I want to take this particular string and I want to turn it into the associated object. So I can write literal path objects. I can write literal objects of any type that I can provide a parser for, XML, whatever you like, without having to go in and modify the core Bosky language. Now, this got us really excited, this notion of Strings are kind of a, a really easy thing, to, but dangerous thing to use because they communicate across the network beautifully. You can put any data you want in it. Um, it's easy to write APIs with them, but they're dangerous because they are unstructured and you don't know quite what you're gonna get in there. And when we were looking at how do we operate, what do we wanna do to program in this cloud-centric world where APIs are being exposed perhaps in different languages and different services and everything needs to go over the network, we wanted to think about what was the right way to have a type system that would allow you to express these APIs effectively, right? And so we wanted to define this notion in Bosky of API types of what we call API types. And they are types that are understandable without looking at an application source code. So I shouldn't have to know about your object model or whether you're Java or JavaScript or C to understand what that type is. It should be validatable for changes against an API semantic version fairly effectively. And it should give a much more precise description of the intent of an argument than just something like string. So what we came up with was sort of inspired first by C++'s plain old data types. These are data types that you can just take as a series of bits, drop into a buffer and ship anywhere and they're sort of magically parsable elsewhere. So for us, these would be things like none, bool, int, string, hash codes, et cetera. You don't have to have a deep understanding of my application to know what those are. The next set are called self-describing types. So these would be tuples and records. And this is kind of like JSON, except we can identify an API tuple as one that only contains other API types. So you will know you will always be able to safely serialize and deserialize this without issues popping up like uh, JSON objects that contain a function or some other thing that is not serializable. We also include enums and our special identifiers because these are fairly compact and easy to work with as well. Finally, we have what we call lifted types. So normally a list of T would not be an API type because I could put objects in it or any other sort of thing. But if T is an API type, then I can also have a list of T as an API type as well. 
So this spectrum allows us to describe very complex object hierarchies and uh, with, with relative ease, and we know that they're always safe to move on and off the network. So let's look at an example of where this might be nice. Um, here we have from GitHub their Git, re, 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 sorry, their Git repositories REST API, and it takes uname as a variable, which is a string. Uh, from the documentation, it takes two parameters, type, which is a string of either all, owner, or member, and sort, which is another string enumeration. Now, if I were to implement um, this function using just strings, I would have a signature like this, where it takes three strings, and then I would have to go manually validate so that the username actually matches GitHub's restrictions on what usernames can do. I would have to validate the type uh, was one of the appropriate strings manually. And if I ever wanted to change this API, say add a new enum, I would need to go through and check all of these places. Now, with these API types, I can define what a username regex is. I can explicitly do these enumerations for what the arguments are. And now repos actually takes a safe string of uname regex. So I can't accidentally pass the sort argument there. It, create, it takes uh, optionally these a type and sort as their appropriate enum types. And so it's very clear what this does. It's very compact. And it allows us the opportunity to do things like uh, put this REST API pragma on there. Now this isn't implemented yet, but what we believe you can do is using this, I can actually go generate that REST API from this function signature. I can generate all of the parsing logic, all of the basic type validation logic, so that this is all done automatically for you and you don't have to worry about writing or updating this code. Further, since this is clearly where the enums are uh, defined, we can actually validate that, say, I wanted to add another uh, field to type enum, say, organization uh, is my type enum. If I go ahead and add this, we can automatically check, is this, did you update the semantic version of your application API as well? And if not, we can warn you that you might break various uh, users of this and you can take the appropriate action. So we're really excited about some of this stuff that's going on here. And I started alluding towards what we would like to do in the future. Um, so let me talk about that. So the first one I, I was mentioning there was this semantic version validation, right? So can we actually have rich support for checking if you change say one of these API types, are you also updating the semantic version of your application appropriately? Now, this isn't comprehensive because you might change the logic somewhere uh, in a way that breaks existing code without knowing uh, changing the signature of your functions. But in addition to sort of some basic sanity checks we can do on say adding enumerations or changing type signatures, we can actually run our verification tools to say, you claimed that this was a semver minor change. So that's only adding new features to your code. If we run any input on the old version, we should get the same output on the new version. And can we verify that that's the case? So that's for you as an API provider. As a consumer, we can also support the version where if you're gonna upgrade a dependency, you can check, is it possible this new dependency is gonna change the behavior of your application somewhere, right? And allow you to not sort of have to update, run your unit tests and hope for the best, but actually have great confidence that that version update didn't break anything, allow you to do those version upgrades much more quickly and much more confidently. Uh, I mentioned uh, sort of hardware accelerators a little earlier, um, and this has been a real challenge uh, to take advantage of these in existing imperative programming languages. But as we mentioned, Bosky provides some really unique opportunities in that it's referentially transparent, it's immutable, and these higher order functions are great for mapping bulk parallel operations to bulk parallel hardware. So I think there's a real potential here. Um, I wanna talk about one limitation in Bosky that we are really thinking about is there's currently no IO support or runtime. You'll notice all of our examples took in arguments, produced results, and that was it. We're focused on high reliability, pure computation. Fortunately, uh, Morgan Stanley is just open sourcing their Morphir framework. And this is a multi-language system for building high reliability services uh, with a focus on transparency, 
and agility and explicitly supporting sort of a multi-platform, multi-language world. So we've started working with them on integrating Bosky in here so that we can use their runtime and hopefully support their vision for building these high reliability services. And I'll have some links later, but we're actually starting to get this developed here on, on GitHub. And I also wanna say, these are the things that I previously mentioned that we're really focused on, but a big promise of Bosky is the opportunity to unlock um, a huge potential for what people are doing in verification, fuzzing, testing, compilers, garbage collection, process resiliency, you know, real-time software and everything else. So these are all things that we've experimented with a little bit and we think are have some potential, but we're super excited about what can happen here and are really interested in seeing what the community starts to do once they can um, get in and start using some of the, the, the IR and building tools on top of it. So uh, I think that brings us to the end of the talk. Um, you know, in conclusion, I wanna just say, what is Bosky? Well, it's really an experiment in how do you build an IR and a programming language where supporting reasoning, both automated and human, is a core principle, is sort of the, the, the guiding principle for how it's built. And the interesting thing is that by making the code easier for machines to understand, in a lot of cases, it's easier for developers to understand and use as well. The second thing is that hopefully we've demonstrated that the IR we have uh, enables deep understanding of a software artifact. Just by excluding some of these features and making some careful design choices, it suddenly becomes drastically easier to reason about the behavior of a program. And, and we think this is a breakthrough in what can be done in the software engineering and compiler space. And we're really excited to see where it goes. And finally, uh, you know, we also showed that Bosky provides a high agility developer experience. It supports dynamic types, it supports union types, it supports everything you would want to expect in a modern language. Plus, it brings new concepts like these typed strings and API types that actually provide create a positive feedback loop because they provide more information for the reasoning engine and the reasoning engine through doing things like verification provides more value to them. So I want to conclude uh, just with a slide with a few links and thank everybody for joining us today. I hope this was interesting to you and we would love to chat with you on our GitHub page with any thoughts, ideas, bugs you happen to find. Thank you very much. Hi, well, thanks everybody for uh, joining us for this webinar on Bosky. Uh, my name is Mark Marin. I was the presenter in the, in the webinar we just watched and it was great. Thanks everybody for joining us. Um, got a lot of good questions coming through. So I wanted to take a minute to just elaborate on a couple of things here. Um, one interesting one I saw several on were sort of the type strings and the uh, API types that were there and whether or not these were something specific to Bosky or how these worked or if these could work in other languages. And I wanted to point out that, you know, one of the goals of Bosky was not just the language in the IR itself, uh, but also to see what concepts were interesting and might be able to be adopted by other languages and might help drive language design forward generally. And this is one feature that actually seems to work great in Bosky and it has a great feedback loop with enabling some of the, the testing and verification and optimization stuff, but it's also pretty easy to extract that concept and apply it even to existing languages. So um, at our GitHub page, we have a, a links of uh, other research papers written. And um, one of those papers is by some of my colleagues where they formalize type strings more generally and apply it to Java and show how it can be used in TypeScript, and then also how you can use it to uh, do more effective fuzz testing. So this was something we thought was really great that's come out of the project already, was the ability to you know, define and understand this feature better and then extract it in a way that can be useful, uh, not just in Bosky or programmers who are using Bosky, but to the wider uh, language design community. Um, let me see, so one other question that I saw uh, come up uh, a couple of times and people have asked generally 
is on like what languages can Bosky target. Um, so right now, it basically uh, emits C++ that you can then compile, um, you know, into a, a, an a EXE that you can run on the command line. Um, as I mentioned in the webinar presentation, one of the key targets we have is integrating this with the Morphia framework um, to basically allow us to do interesting I.O. and make the language more useful. Uh, people have asked about WAS WASM. Um, that's definitely possible since we produce C++ code that should be mostly WASM clean. There might need to be a little work to allow WASM compilation, but that's definitely something that's possible. Uh, the other thing that we've looked at is integrating this with Node.js by automatically generating uh, native modules via the NAPI interface so that you can basically take some chunk of JavaScript you have, uh, rewrite it in Bosky, and then export that as a native module instead of an old uh, regular JavaScript module and sort of swap out parts of your program without having to rewrite the whole thing uh, in, in Bosky from the ground up. Let's see. Um, then I think there was one question uh, on garbage collection. And I, I mentioned that we have an interesting reference counting collector that doesn't need to do as many increment and decrement operations as you would expect if you were trying to do, say, a reference counting collector for Java. And that's because a lot of the features that we have in Bosky give us very interesting invariants from a memory management standpoint, right? So a lot of garbage collection is building these invariants about what state the objects have to be in and what you can always assume is true about where pointers go. So one big challenge, for example, in reference counting is how do I account for cycles? If I have a cycle of references, then they'll all keep the ref count of the object they point to as positive and I'll never collect it with a simple ref counting collector. So in a language like Java, I would have to not only have my reference counting collector, but I would have to have a, uh, a, mark, uh, a marking collector that would incrementally or occasionally run to collect cycles that the reference counting collector couldn't handle. Now, Bosky is interesting because it is designed in a way that prevents the construction of any cyclic data structure, for example. So we, by definition, don't need to have a backup collector to deal with cycles because they can't exist. Uh, similarly, we also can guarantee that there are no pointers from new or old objects to new objects. So that allows us to structure the collector in a way where we don't have to have a write barrier at all uh, for these mutations of old objects invalidating pointers to new objects or changing their ref count that way. So this allows us to simplify a lot of logic that we would normally have to deal with in a collector in a language that has mutation that we don't have to in Bosky. Now, we have a, a collector that is sort of simple, and we think we can use these invariants to improve that um, actually quite a bit. But it's really exciting that this sort of is not just about you know, verification, but some of these simplifications actually allow us to think a lot more aggressively about things like optimization and like building memory management. So, we're excited about that as, as well. And so I think we have one more question that I can uh, elaborate on a little bit here. Um, as, as I mentioned, we are doing this as an open source project. So we have a repo on GitHub. It's on the resource list uh, on the webinar here. And for the past year, we've, you know, we, we started in, this project is in the open. We wanted to develop in the open. But for the past year, uh, we've sort of been iterating heavily, experimenting a lot. Um, and so it's been a little difficult for people to get involved. Uh, we were recently just stabilizing the, the project. We have the language in a state where we think all of the big pieces are in place. And so one of our goals going forward is to make this uh, repository uh, more stable and more open to the community and easier for people to get started with. So, um, you know, I would encourage anybody who's interested. Uh, it's not as um, newbie friendly, I guess, as I would like yet, but you're more than welcome to come to the repository, uh, post issues, post questions. 
there are issues that people can work on all the way from you know simple bug fixes and improving the documentation up to projects that would be you know uh, research uh, publication worthy so there's a wide range of stuff and we're, we're definitely want to make this more stable and want to make it easier for everybody in the community to engage in this project. So definitely come join us in the GitHub repo if you have any other questions or, or want to learn more. And I think that uh, covers most of the questions that came up here in the webinar. And um, hopefully it was really interesting to you. I appreciate everybody joining us and we'll hopefully see you in the GitHub repository.